just wanted to give a little background on Jim. He's originally from Rowley, Massachusetts, and he attended Essex Agricultural and Technical Institute, which is where he first learned about the profession of forestry. He earned his bachelor's degree in forestry from University of Mass Amherst in May 2012. His family owns a woodlot in Corinna, Maine, where he has spent a lot of time in the area enjoying outdoor recreation, like hunting and fishing. He lo uh, spending time on the family woodlot in Corinna is where he really developed a fascination with trees and the forest and where he's honed his passion for practicing silviculture. Jim joined the Maine Forest Service in the fall of 2020 after he relocated up here from New Hampshire, where he worked for a small family-owned forestry consulting company. He has a great deal of experience in both invasive plant and insect species mitigation and control, timber harvest supervision, as well as forest management planning. In his spare time, Jim's a passionate angler and he enjoys spending as much time outside as possible with his wife and his two dogs. And he's looking forward to becoming a father any day now, as in hopefully this week. Um, Jim has, uh, <laughs> just in case you were wondering where Jer uh, Jim's area is, it's he's in the greater Greenville area, covers kind of uh, Sebec to Skowhegan and North. So if any of you are located in that area, he would love to meet with you and take you out on a walk and talk. So Jim, if you would unmute yourself and share your presentation, we're good to go. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, great to see you all. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about tree ID today. Um, everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay. Um, so ideally, you know, tree ID would be best to do out in the field, but we're gonna do the best we can today doing it on Teams. It's it's just doesn't do it quite justice when you do it online. It's much better when you can see the whole tree, but, but um, we're gonna do the best we can tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and uh, let me know if you guys are able to see my PowerPoint. There you go. Awesome. So, yep. So, you know, the Maine Forest Service has a great book called The Forest Trees of Maine. Um, the, the Forest Service has actually been producing it now for over 100 years. So I think our most up to date is 2008. And um, if you don't already have a, a copy of it, I encourage everybody to reach out to their district forester. They'd be happy to meet with you and, and provide you with a copy. It's a really gr great, well illustrated book with a lot of good information in it. So yeah, why why are we so fascinated with trees? Um, you know, they're just like big, long-lived plants. They're beautiful. They have a lot of great uses. Um, you know, some people just like to know. I'm I'm a tree nerd myself, so the, the more I can learn about them, the better. Um, yeah, like I said, the the forest trees of Maine is basically what this PowerPoint is going to be based off of. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is right in the book. Um, so yeah, we have we have 65 native species um, of tree in Maine. Um, some of them are more shrub-like, but um, we have about 65 native trees. And then um, that 11 exotic trees is a, is a rough number. We have a lot of uh, you know planted trees, but you know quite a few of them are planted extensively commercially, as well as some of the just escaped um, cultivation and are now considered invasive, but they're common throughout the state. So um, we're going to start with um, our conifers or um, cone bearing or, uh, you know, evergreen trees. Um, we have about 14 of these and, um, you know, they're trees with, with needles. Um, they typically stay green year round, except for a couple oddballs. Um, one native being tamarack or large tree that does does lose its needles in the fall. So these are our, our most common conifers in Maine here. We're gonna talk in depth about most of these trees tonight. So one of their most, you know, prolific and, and valuable, you know, conifers that we have in the state is, is white pine. Um, you know, back during colonial era, um, they were sought after um, by the British Navy because they were such large um trees that made great mass for for uh sailing vessels um um they were you know extremely large back then they um you know well you know well over 100 feet tall and and you know three plus feet in diameter and they were extremely valuable where the, where the king of england would actually um 
you know, had had folks out in the woods marking them as property of the crown caused a lot of uh, uh, dislike by the colonists. Um, um, they grow pretty much statewide um, in a variety of, of soil conditions and climates. Um, they prefer sort of well-drained sandy soils, but they're, they're present in pretty much most sites in the state. Um, their bark is, is pretty rough and furrowed. Uh, it's usually a, a gray to dark brown color. Younger trees are typically be uh, a much smoother um, greenish brown um, and, until they get old and they start to furrow. Um, one interesting uh, note when it comes to conifers, especially when they're young, you can get a pretty good estimate of their age by just being able to count the whorls of each each year's growth. So that that distance between each you know each whorl is actually one year's worth of growth. So their needles are are pretty long. They're they're soft and uh, flexible. Um, they're always in clusters of five. So out of out of all the pines in Maine, I think they're the only pine that has needles in cluster of uh, five. And then um, they also have a pretty large cone. Out of our all of our native conifers, it's by far the largest cone. So then we have uh, red pine, sometimes known as Norway pine, as in Norway, Maine, not the country in Europe. Um, they're uh, they're a fairly common tree in Maine. A lot of the a lot of the red pine you see in Maine is actually planted, but they are they are native. Um, there there was quite an effort um, in the past to, to create red pine plantations. It's sort of fallen out of favor just due to lack of a good market for red pine. Um, they are, you know, they make pretty nice uh, utility poles. So as as its name, you know, tells you, it has kind of a rusty reddish bark that kind of peels easily when um, when you just kind of scrape at it. Um, they're usually a pretty well formed tree. They grow pretty tall and straight. They have a pretty distinct cone. They're they're typically about two inches long and pretty oval. And um, they have very long, you know, pretty pretty long needles, and and they they're always in clusters of two. So we're going to talk a little bit about balsam fir. Um, balsam fir is is probably the, the most common softwood in Maine. Um, it's you know when you when you think of a Christmas tree, you're probably thinking of a balsam fir. There, over 90% of the Christmas trees grown in Maine are, are balsam fir, but it's also you know used you know for commercial forest products such as you know lumber as well as making pulp for paper. So one of the noteworthy things on on balsam fir is their bark. It's usually pretty smooth. Um, it's also you know, covered in these these resin blisters, and actually, if you were to take your finger and and pop that, it actually will ooze, you know, um, resin right out of it. So their needles are uh, pretty short and flat. They grow horizontal horizontally on the stem. Um, their buds are are usually clear. Um, they're covered with a clear waxy resin. The, the the one interesting thing about balsam fir is you rarely ever see a cone because actually when they're when they're the cone is maturing on the tree, the scales will actually fall off and release the, all of the seeds within the cone and dispersing them with the wind. Unlike most other conifers, that actually the, the cone stays together and drops off the tree. So we're going to talk about next tree. We're going to talk about here is is a uh, eastern hemlock. Um, out, of, out of the out of all the conifers, most people, you know, when you're going to confuse our native conifers, it usually comes down to to hemlock and balsam fir, especially when they're young seedlings, because the foliage is somewhat similar. Um, but it's it's pretty easy to tell the difference between mature, you know, hemlock and balsam fir because hemlock be, can become a, a very large, impressive tree where. Balsam fir tends to be a smaller diameter, shorter lived tree. 
they're both very tolerant of shade, but in terms of the longevity, um, hemlock can become, at, it's one of the longest living, you know, trees in Maine. They can be in excess of 500 years old. They typically like to inhabit, you know, your cooler, moist sites, um, north facing slopes, uh, drainages, places like that. Um, they often create like almost pure stands of hemlock that um, are very shaded and they create great wintering habitat for deer because they intercept a lot of the snow as it comes down. So it makes it much easier for the deer to get around. It has a uh, Pretty, pretty distinctive bark, pretty large, um, deeply furrowed. Even, even on your smaller trees, it's pretty noteworthy. So as, as I mentioned before, um, hemlock foliage is pretty similar to, um, to balsam fir, but the, typically the needles are, you know, quite a bit smaller, um, usually less than an inch. And then typically as, as you get close, uh, closer to the end of the twig that they will kind of taper off in length. They have pretty small cones relative to all our other um, softwoods, you know, usually less than an inch long and they're always on the, on the hang down from the ends of the twigs. So here we have a comparison of, of hemlock foliage and fir foliage on the, on the bottom here of this picture. Um, so one of the ways I learned, you know, classically to tell the differences. So hemlock has these little pedestals on the stem. If you strip, you know, some of the foliage off, um, that the the needles are actually attached to the the twig on. So I I learned it as they have a stem lock. So the needle is attached to the twig with a stem lock. So stem lock equals hemlock. Whereas on the fir, that's that's absent. It's smooth. There's no there's no pedestal. So we have another important group of uh, evergreen trees here is spruce. We have um, three native spruces and a couple non-native spruce in Maine. Um, you know, commercially, they're one of the most valuable trees we have in Maine. Um, they, uh, you know, especially, especially our, you know, our native spruces, red spruce, white spruce, they make um, great you know, lumber as well as as they they are often used to create pulp as well. Um, we we have a couple. So our our native spruces would be red spruce, white spruce, and black spruce. And then our non natives are our blue spruce and Norway spruce. Um, typically, you're only going to see blue spruce um, in like landscape settings. And they there are some commercial um, commercial plantations of Norway spruce, but you don't see them too often. So all all spruces are are, are shade tolerant. Um, they're typically, you know, they're very common the further north and in in, in in down east Maine. So here we have a picture of red sp spruce foliage. Um, one noteworthy thing about it is the beetles are actually. Uh, Square. I'm getting a real bad echo here. I think someone's unmuted. But um, yeah, so their needles are actually kind of squared and they're always pointy. So you get, you know, so you have your spiky spruce and your friendly fir. So if you're you're feeling um, conifer foliage and it's got sharp points on the needles, it's good chance it's a it's a spruce tree. Um, the tip cones are typically um, a half inch to two inches long, and that's across, you know, all three of our native species. So white spruce, um, it's pretty, pretty common throughout the state, um, you know, increasing in, in uh, dominance as you go north. Um, often, colloquially, it's known as a cat spruce because it has a kind of a, a very distinctive spell, smell when you crush it or uh, cut it. Um, it definitely has, um, I think, out of all our native spruces, I think it has the, the probably the biggest cone. So here we have our uh, blue spruce. So they are not native to Maine, but they're extensively used in landscape settings because they have a nice blue hue to the foliage. So they're pretty easy to tell and, you know, be able to speciate. 
they have a pretty large cone that grows up to four inches long. Our other non-native spruce is our, is a Norway spruce. Um, it's it's been extensively planted in plantations as well as uh, used ornamentally. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to distinguish from our other spruces because it has sort of long pendulous branches that hang down. Um, really beautiful tree, especially when mature. They have pretty pretty large cones for for a spruce tree. So we have one sort of oddball when it comes to uh, our uh, native conifers. Um, so we have tamarack, which is ac um, actually a deciduous conifer. So it actually um, loses its needles in the in the fall. Um, so just like our our hardwoods, it they they actually change a, a beautiful golden yellow color. They're they're beautiful in the fall, and they drop their their needles just like hardwoods drop their leaves. Um, Historically, it had a lot of uses, um, especially in the ship uh, building industry. Um, not, not so much now commercially, but it's um, wood is very resistant to uh, salt water conditions. Um, you're typically going to find them in your low lying um, swampy areas adjacent to wetlands and things like that. They're not they're not really an upland tree. Uh, bark is very similar to uh, our native spruces. Often, if you're going to confuse a uh, tamarack with something, it's it's going to be a spruce tree. Their bark is is very similar. Uh, one one noteworthy thing is um, about larch is um, their foliage is is actually um, born on little wooden spurs on the twig. So um, in the fall and the winter time, if, you know, when they're not when they're not holding needles, you'll see these almost. Some people might consider it almost like a thorn, but that's actually where the foliage grows out of. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, the, the, it's very soft foliage. And we have our uh, our northern white cedar. Um, it's common in northern eastern Maine. Um, like tamarack, it prefers moist sites um, in swamps along drainages, and it'll often um, colonize old pasture sites, sites that are abandoned by uh, abandoned for agriculture that have a high water table. Um, the wood is actually uh, very rot resistant, um, makes great um, Things that are exposed to weather and, and, and soil, so like shingles and fence posts and things like that. It's it's really great for those type of uses. Well, so it has pretty interesting foliage compared to a lot of the other conifers. It has a scale, not a needle. Um, they're about an eighth eighth inch long. They're kind of a wax. They have a waxy kind of feel to them, and they're a deep blue green color. The bark is a, a typically a reddish brown that kind of forms in a long stringy strips. So that's going to cover it now for our for our, what we're going to cover for our evergreen trees. So we're going to start talking about our our uh, deciduous or broadleafed um, trees that are native to Maine here and some non-natives as well. So here's here's sort of a dichotomous key here for our our forest trees in Maine. So we're going to talk a little about maples. Um, you know, we have a fair fair variety of maples that grow here in Maine, and they're you know they they grow across the straight state, and they're um, one of the most common hardwood trees you're going to find. Especially this guy right here, red maple, is by far the most common hardwood tree you're going to find in in Maine, and out of the maples that 90% of the maples in, in Maine are, are red or red maples. I'm sorry. Um, bark on, on large trees tends to be rough and uh, rigid and kind of peely. Um, and the young trees, it tends to be tight and sometimes are often confused with beech trees because they haven't started to furrow and peel yet. Um, does have commercial value. Um, you know, 
higher quality trees um, make really nice lumber and you know, furniture and another uh, high value products are, are made from it as well as, uh, you know, low, you know, typically it's, it's not as highly valued as, as sugar maple in terms of its lumber quality, but you can get some really nice individuals that make great lumber. A lot of times it's used for sort of lower value products like pallets and things like that. Um, you can you can tap red maple just like you would you know sugar maple to produce uh, syrup. You do typically have a shorter season to tap red maple, typically only because they uh, tend to flower earlier. And um, once once they begin to flower, it um, it tends to give the sap kind of an off flavor. So all of our all of our native maple maples. Um, are five lobed. Um, typically, those the lobes closest to your petiole are the stem that attaches the leaf to the twig. They're usually um, reduced or not as conspicuous. So one of the things that make red maple red maple is the fact that it produces these beautiful red flowers. Um, you know, last week or week before, I'm sure you noted a lot of beautiful red maple flowers out there. We had a pretty good set of flowers this year. Um, also, the twigs are, you know, the terminal twigs are nice red color, so it makes it pretty easy to distinguish from other maples. Um, they have, you know, wing seeds that are uh, paired like, like all maples do. So here we have, you know, sugar maple, also known as rock maple or hard maple. So when you think of you know your classic sugar bush you're thinking of, of sugar maple it has that classic maple leaf you know when you're thinking the canadian flag or whatever there's there's your uh classic sugar maple leaf right there uh, makes makes beautiful lumber um you know we, when you think about uh like bowling alley uh that that's made from sugar maple um great great very durable wood beautiful wood So here's a comparison of uh, sugar maple twigs to uh, twigs and buds uh, to red maple. You notice the the, sh the sugar maple is a kind of a a dull brown color, whereas your red maple is bright red. Um, typically, the, the the buds are much pointier than red maple, and especially the terminal bud. Almost, um, we had if we could turn turn that twig, they almost looks like like a crown. If you were to turn it, you can see the auxiliary buds on the side here. So here's, we're gonna compare sugar maple to red maple foliage. Um, you know, your lobes here are, are much softer than a red maple. They have, they have much more of a uh, U-shaped to them, whereas your red maple foliage is gonna have a hard V to it. Um, much more sparsely toothed than your red maple. So here we have some uh, silver maple foliage. So very, very deeply lobed, or very deeply sinus, I'd say, with with a long kind of irregular um, lobing. So it has um, really shaggy bark when mature. Um, you're typically only going to see red maple in, in the lowland sites adjacent to uh, rivers. Um, it's, you're never going to find it growing in upland unless it's been planted, but it is, it is very commonly used in landscape settings because it's tolerant to um, soil compaction and it grows very quickly. So the twigs are somewhat similar to, to uh, red maple except that they're more of a chestnut brown color so you you know you have sort of your classic um red maple seeds you know in pairs oftentimes your one of those seeds is not as well developed as the other so here's my least favorite tree norway maple um they're very commonly planted in landscape settings and unfortunately they're um, highly invasive and they can invade you know your woodlots pretty quickly they produce 
a ton of seeds every fall. Um, they are able to utilize the growing season much longer than our, a lot of our native trees. They're oftentimes the first tree to leaf out in the springtime and the last tree to lose its leaves in the fall. Um, the, the foliage is, is uh, very, very similar to uh, our native sugar maple. Typically, it's typically it's a, a darker green color and oftentimes has a very long petiole to it, the stem that attaches the leaf to the twig. Um, one of the best ways to distinguish a Norway maple from a sugar maple is when you have your leaves on and you pull the pull the leaf in the in the petiole off the twig and look where the, the petiole attaches the twig it often well it always will produce a, a milky white sap whereas your your native sugar maple is going to be clear. So the bark of Nora maple is uh, very similar to our native ash trees. Um, I think if you're going to confuse the two to get, um, you know, especially not during the grow growing season, a lot of people uh, end up confusing Nora maple for ash because they're both oppositely branched and uh, the bark is similar. Um, once again, you have a, a, a paired fruit here. One noteworthy thing about Nora maple is they're I almost often consider they look like a clothes hanger. Um, the, they're not as uh, there's a much more uh, broader angle between the, the fruits, unlike um, like our natives that are much closer together. So here's another. It's it's another maple tree that you find in Maine. It is is technically not native to Maine. It is native to North America and as well as Southern New England. Um, it's noteworthy in the sense that it's a uh, maple, but it has uh, a compound leaf, um, unlike our all the other maples we've talked about that have a, a simple leaf. So it has it has three leaflets on on one petiole. So the bark is uh, is typically smooth on young trees and becomes rough and fissured on on older trees. Um, the twigs are are noteworthy because they're uh, they're often either a, a pretty bright green or a maroon color, and they're always covered with a like a chalky white bloom. They they do escape cultivation. A lot of times you'll see them in in sort of moist areas in between. In, in between yards and things in, in more urban and suburban areas. Not nearly as invasive as, as Norway maple though. So we'll talk about one more uh, maple here, um, striped maple. Um, it's much more of a, sh a shrub it's, or a small tree. Um, it doesn't become very large. It has, you know, broad, you know, large foliage. Um, does not have as much um, sinusing as as all our other na native maples. It still is serrated along the edge, and usually your small stems have this kind of bright green bark to them. It's pretty noteworthy. So we're going to talk about a few of our birch trees. So. Pretty sure everybody here is probably familiar with paper birch. Um, you know, the noteworthy thing about paper birch is that it is it is a true early successional or pioneer species. It needs, you know, pretty much full sunlight to grow and do well. So you're you're really only going to find it in in um, areas that were cut over heavily or 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 burned by a wildfire. Um, does have you know it is used commercially pretty pretty actively it's it's used for um you know pulp and it is it is used for saw logs as well so here we have gray birch which oftentimes is confused with with paper birch just because it has you know white bark but um it is a different species it's a, typically a very short-lived um never gets very large you know an, an eight inch diameter uh gray birch is is pretty exceptional there 
they usually uh, never live to be large enough to get to be a, a commercial size, but they are used as you know pulp and fire when when they do reach you know a commercial size. So the the foliage of gray birch and white birch is similar, um, except that uh, gray birch is much more triangular, much more pointed, has like a curved point here at the end. So that's usually the, the the best way to 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 speciate the between paper and gray birch. So here's a good comparison of 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 the bark of of gray birch on the left here and 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 white birch or paper birch on the left. The paper birch is much uh, as it readily peels. You know, when you when you're out in the woods and you or you want to get a fire going, you want to find some nice peely paper birch because that that takes a spark really well whereas you have a real hard time peeling the bark off a of gray birch and typically gray birch will hangs on to a lot of these smaller branches far down on its stem whereas uh, paper birch tends to shed its lower branches pretty readily and then we're going to talk a little bit about yellow birch here so that's Jan down there, I think. Jan Santer. Um, so yellow birch is um, probably the largest yellow, uh, largest of the birch trees grown in Maine. Um, so it is much, um, it's more tolerant of shade than than um, the other two birches I talked about. It's more, it's more of an intermediate. So it'd be similar to like, um, you know, red maple or oak in terms of its shade tolerance. Um, so typically on younger trees, it has a sort of a golden yellow, somewhat peely bark, similar to paper birch, but not quite as peely. Um, you're, you're, you're typically going to find it on your cool, moist sites, not, not necessarily true wetlands, but areas with a high water table, typically seepy sites are, are uh, where you're going to see yellow birch growing. Um, beautiful wood. It has a lot of, you know, commercial value. It's, it's uh, very strong and hard wood. Um, used for veneer as well as uh, furniture and, and uh, gun stocks. The, the one tree you might be able to confuse this with is, is black birch, which is another birch native um, only to extreme southern Maine. Um, they both have, when you when you crush or, or cut the, the stem, um, it has like a, a very uh, noticeable uh, wintergreen smell to it. So the foliage is, is very similar to paper birch, only that um, it tends to be a little bit longer. And uh, like all birches, it, it, um, the flowers are catkins and um, almost look like a small pine cone, but they're, they're the flower of the birch tree. So here we're going to talk about oaks. Um, so we really have like two different groups of oaks in Maine. So you have your your black oak group, or some sometimes they call them red red oak group, and then your white oak group. So the best way to to um, differentiate the two is uh, your black oaks are always going to have a, a a pointed lobe. They almost come to like a little hair at the point of each lobe. Um, whereas your white oaks have a very noticeably rounded lobe on the on end of their lobes, and uh, black oaks or red oaks, um, their their fruit or acorns takes two years to develop on the tree, whereas your white oaks mature in one growing season. Um, the inside of the of the acorn shell on 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 black oaks is is hairy, and then um, your white oaks the inside of the shell lacks hairs. But you need you obviously need the fruit to be able to tell the difference. So red oak is um, the most common oak you're going to find in Maine. Uh, I believe it's present, you know, across all the counties in Maine, but it's it's much more commonly found, you know, in the southern portion of the state. Um, the wood is is uh, probably one of you know between sugar maple and yellow birch is probably one of the most valued you know woods that you're going to find here in Maine has a lot of um, value for veneer furniture. It's um, very durable even in, in the weather, so it's great for wear items like lofts or traps and, and pilings and things like that. 
Um, it, it grows best in, in, in rich upland sites, but um, it also um, can also compete very well on sort of dry, rocky, um, you'd call it xeric, you know, sort of low moisture, low nutrient sites. That it's typically of, of a lot of, of the black oak family can tolerate those sort of conditions. But in Maine, you're typically going to see it in your in your moist upland sites. But in the southern portion of this tree's range, it's much more competitive in those drier areas. So like all oaks, they, uh, they have a cluster of, of buds on the ends of the twigs that are often sharp. So here's, here's a good uh, picture of, of, of look at the ends of the lobes. They're very pointed and they almost have like a, a hair at the end of it. So we'll contrast that to white oak. Um, pretty noteworthy, the, the bark of, of white oak does sort of have a whitish gray hue to it. You're only really going to see this um, tree growing in southern Maine. Um, like I mentioned, most oaks, you know, can grow on your sun. It's sort of gravelly, sandy, dry sites, but they, they do, they, they reach their best potential in your more richer areas. Another, another uh, pretty widely used um, for, for different uses in lumber. So here's a good picture here of uh, white oak foliage. Note the very rounded lobes, no hairs on the tips or points. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about ashes here. So ash is noteworthy in the sense it has a uh, compound leaf. So it has one long petiole and uh, and then it has several leaflets anywhere between uh, seven and nine leaflets per petiole that are come off oppositely with one terminal leaflet. So here's a here's a good picture of uh, the bark of an ash tree. Um, uh, it's it's pretty rough uh, and, and with long vertical furrows. Um, one noteworthy thing about ash is it it's um it it has a much higher uh, nutrient requirement than most of our hardwoods, so it needs fairly rich, you know, moist and well drained sites for it to to do well or even be present. You're never going to find ash growing in a a, a real dry, um, poor nu nutrient area. So if you see ash, you know it's a if you see ash on it growing on a site, you know it's probably a pretty decent site to grow most species of hardwood. So like I said, we have several leaflets uh, growing on, on one petiole. Um, the twigs are, are pretty stout, um, oppositely branched. So you notice that there's uh, buds on either side of the, of the twig here. So we also have green ash, which is another tree that grows mostly in <clears throat> floodplain areas in Maine and, and on moist sites. Um, it's not nearly as abundant as as white ash, but it does grow in throughout most of central and southern Maine. Um, bark is bark is similar to um, white white ash, but it tends to be a little the furrows tend to be a little bit further apart. Uh, foliage is, is uh, very similar to white ash, but you know one one great way to differentiate the two is uh is there's a lot of fine, almost like fuzzy hair on the underside of the leaves. Once again, we have opposite buds here. Um, a lot of numerous hairs on the on the fine um, on the petioles and and uh, undersides of the leaf. So another tree here um, is, is, is basswood or, or American linden. Um, one, one of the most noteworthy things about it is it's, it's large, very large heart-shaped leaf. Um, it's, it's noteworthy just in the sense of how, how big and, and uh, 
large the the foliage is on these trees um the buds are off are, are cone shaped and, and shiny and they're they're alternately branched so it has it has a a samara um fruit they similar to maple but but um they have a wing but they also have a, a a seed that hangs off that wing, which is, you know, different than than your maples. Um, it, it, you're only going to find basswood growing on, much like ash trees. You're only going to find it growing on really high quality sites. It's never going to be growing in a in a dry, um, nutrient poor area. The wood is uh very soft and and white in color. Um, it, it's really, uh, really easy to carve it because it's it's not a very dense wood. And um, the honey made from um, the nectar of, of uh, basswood is, is, is excellent. So here we have um, American beech, um, very, very common tree across the state of Maine. Um, very shade tolerant. You'll often find it growing in the understory. Um, one other noteworthy thing about beech is that Oftentimes it'll hold um, last year's foliage well, well throughout the uh, dormant season. Um, very hard wood. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It um, historically had a lot, a lot more um, uses for for small wear items like clothespins and dowels. Uh, makes makes excellent firewood. Unfortunately. Um, Right around a hundred years ago, um, a, a fungus that we call beech bark disease was inadvertently um, introduced to North America, and um, it's caused a lot of decline in our, our beech stands. You note this this picture on on the on the right compared to the left, where it has these big pock marks on it, and uh, that's those are uh, cankers created by by the fungal pathogen. Um, infecting the the vascular part of the tree and see that the healthy beach on the left here is very smooth oftentimes they'll call it like a like elephant trunk tree because it's so smooth and uh free of any sort of fissures so the leaf is you know sort of your classic ovoid shape typically three to five inches long with uh some coarse um coarse um margin with, with small little teeth uh, the, the bud is pretty distinct. It's long pointed bud, you know, typically a, at least about an inch long. Um, the beech nut is um, extremely valuable for, for wildlife, but unfortunately because of of uh, beech bark disease, it's put a lot of stress on stands infected with it and they do not produce the same amount of, of fruit as they historically did. So here we're going to talk about our are a couple of our aspens or poplars here. So we have uh, trembling or uh, or quaking aspen, pretty common throughout the state. Um, you know, it's called qu trembling or quaking aspen because um, the petiole of the leaf um, is actually flattened. So when the wind blows, it actually causes the the, the leaf to flap back and forth. The bark on on young trees is, is uh, you know, smooth to a, a grayish green color and becomes more furrowed and gray as they as they get older. Um, so like like a lot of the birch trees, um, they are they are shade intolerant early successional species. So you're never going to find um, your aspens growing in, in, in shade. They pretty much need full sunlight to survive. Um, they they do best on on sort of well drained but moist sites. Um, a lot of people just refer to, to uh, aspens as as poplars or popple. A lot of mills just they call aspen. They just buy it as as popple. They don't see the difference between species. Here's a good picture of uh you know of quaking uh, foliage. Note the the petiole is is actually flattened. It's not round, and that's what makes it tremble. Buds are dark brown, uh, have sort of a shiny 
um, varnished appearance. So here's here's one of our other common uh, aspens, big tooth aspen. So the foliage is, is very similar to quaking, um, aside from it being typically on average being much larger leaf than than quaking, and it has a you know as its name um, denotes, it has has pretty no uh, noteworthy teeth along the margin. Typically, it becomes a much larger, more well formed tree than quaking aspen. If you're out in the woods and you see a 20 plus inch aspen tree that's you know 70 feet tall, there's a good chance that that's that's a big tooth aspen. They they're pretty nice, nicely growing, stately tree. So yeah, we're going to talk about uh, one more hardwood tree or one more group of trees here is our, our cherries. Um, great great wildlife tree because they produce you know small small fruits that are. Uh, are valuable to a lot of species of wildlife, from birds to black bears. Um, they are they are sort of a an early successional tree as well, like your pin and pin cherry and common choke cherry. They need full sunlight um, to to grow and do well. You're never going to find them growing in the shade. So black cherry is one of our more it's it's much more tree tree like. You know, it becomes a a large forest tree, unlike those other two that I mentioned that are typically small trees or shrubs. Um, right in Maine, you're typically about, about central Maine is is as far north as you're going to see um, black cherry. I'm sure it does occur in pockets in northern Maine, um, but pretty noteworthy bark has uh, black um, platy irregular bark. Typically. You know, doesn't become a, a well-formed tree like it does um, in more southern portions of its range, like say New York and Pennsylvania, where, it, where it's a very you know well-formed tree and it's um, you know very valuable for its lumber. Um, typically, just because it's at the northern end of its range, it becomes sort of a crooked, irregular stem. So it has a very you know classic ovoid shape to it, the foliage. It has a, a shiny, almost kind of leathery um, feeling to it. And it's pretty easy to to, uh, to identify by the rusty hairs that grow along the mid vein on the underside of the leaf. So that pretty much wraps up our uh, my uh, presentation on, on our trees in Maine. I, I could talk a lot more about this, but trying to keep it to an hour here. So anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We do oh, actually have, have a couple of questions, Jim. Sure. Um, one gentleman asks if you would tell us a little bit about Emerald Ash Borer and how Maine is being impacted by it. So yes, um, so right now um, we do have, it, there is Emerald Ash Borer in Maine. I think right now it's in, in just in York and Cumberland counties, I'm sure Mort would probably have a pretty good answer to that. But I believe it's just those two counties right now. Um, it's we, in Aroostook as well. There is there is there also is a pocket of it up up in Aroostook County as well. That was clearly someone that was not natural movement of the insect. That was someone transporting wood products. Whereas down in southern and in uh, western Maine, that's natural dispersal from established populations in New Hampshire. Um, coming from New Hampshire, um, you know, I, I watched I watched Emerald Ash Borer kind of quickly march across the area that I, I worked in. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, usually by the time you note the decline or the evidence of the insect in the tree, the population is usually well established in that area. Um, Maine, um, the I'm sorry, the, the USDA has actually abandoned their 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 federal quarantine, but the state of Maine still is, has enacted you know its own quarantine on on moving ash products. Um, it's it's really to slow the spread. It's eventually it's going to you know cover the entirety of ash's range. Is there any other questions about that I could ask? Un unfortunately. It's, you know, it's a it's a difficult situation. Um, 
like I said, I've, I've watched it. I've watched it naturally disperse across other other areas of northern New England, and it's only a matter of time before it does the same thing here. I think it's important to, to uh, tell people that one of the worst ways that it spreads is by people moving firewood. So it's really a good idea to buy your firewood where you are. If you're a camper, don't bring firewood from your home to where you're camping. Absolutely. Uh, that's why a lot of our forest pests have been transported around is in in uh, untreated wood products like like firewood. So we had another question. Uh, when is something defined as invasive? Is the term only applied to non-natives? So that's a great question. Um, so typically it, it's applied to things that are, are not native. We do have a few trees that are considered invasive that are, are they're native to North America, but Maine was not historically part of their range, like box elder as well as uh, black locust. So what one of the things that make a, a plant invasive is that um, it has no natural controls. So a lot of our native trees have have insects and and you know have herbivory occur to them by a lot of, of our native insects um, and, and as well as these non-native trees are like Nora maple, for example, is able to utilize um, much more of the growing season than a lot of our native trees. Like if you're out, especially if you go to like some of our cities like, like Bangor and Augusta and Nora maples are already fully leafed out. Is it, and then if you go to an area with, with native, you know, sugar maples might be that, you know, both of those trees would occupy sort of similar niche in their habitat in their native ranges, you know, sugar maples are just beginning to to grow their leaves so that's those are a couple reasons why why plants can become invasive and uh, we have another question from john are white oaks moving north with climate change that's a great question um i believe there is evidence to show that you know a lot of trees that are, have more of a southern distribution are actually starting to creep north as as the as the climate becomes more adventitious for them they're able to you know slowly work their way into more northern reaches of their range i, I noticed a lot of that um working in new hampshire with a few other species of of uh of hardwood uh, such as black birch, which is typically more associated with more Appalachian, you know, southern forest is is becoming more common in, in sort of the, the sapling and pole um, stage of growth. You know, a lot of a lot of the stocking of of, of young trees is represented in, in trees that are uh, historically common much further south. So I, I would say yes to that question. Um, and Ben, we also have a question. How often does a walk and talk happen in non-COVID times? Uh, actually, they're happening in COVID times as well. Um, you, you can get a walk and talk now. We do um, try to social distance. If you feel more comfortable, we will wear a mask. We don't go into people's homes, um, which in the past, you know, we used to go in and enjoy a cup of coffee or tea, but um, you can sign up for a walk and talk right now, and we'd be happy to accommodate you and go out and walk your woodlot. We have another question here. Um, what about that shrub tree buckthorn? Oh, oh, you mean common <laughs> buckthorn or glossy buckthorn? So yeah, both of those, both both buckthorns are non-native. They're native to you know Europe. And they're they're pretty invasive, unfortunately. Um, they're one of the, in my experience, one of the harder trees to control, especially mechanically. Um, unfortunately, they're really they have a really hardy root system. They produce a ton of fruits. Um, deer do not like to eat them. Then um, once they're established, they're they're pretty tough to control. A lot of times. 
they'll be present in like uh, like power line right of ways and things like that because they typically grow lower and they they handle being mowed down pretty well. You can have some success controlling them with with uh, herbicides like like glyphosate, but it typically requires, you know, at least two treatments, a lot of times three treatments to uh, really get that population under control. Does anyone else have a question? Um, Mort did put some information up there about the research that the Forest Health Division is doing on emerald ash borer. If you go to the Maine Forest Service website um, at maine.gov, you will find all kinds of links about invasives, about um, diseases. We are having um, a couple of speakers. Our last class in June um, includes our pathologist and one of our entomologists. And they're going to be talking a lot about um, diseases and and uh, insects that are found um, in our trees now that didn't used to be. Alyssa just posted that there is a resource for climate adapted species. Uh, if you click on that, and that kind of talks about northern New England um, tree species and how climate change is kind of affecting them. I will I will touch again on on ash borer. Um, if you do have you know a fair amount of ash on your property, the best thing you can do is just monitor the situation. I don't I don't encourage landowners to just like liquidate their ash in their forest because you know because of ash borer. Um, we've we've had some. We, I think we should learn from past mistakes when it comes to you know these whether it's insects or or fungal pathogens um, you know coming through our 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 in in damaging and in and destroying our native trees you know maintaining that genetic diversity on the landscape i think is really important and by removing all the the trees preemptively we'll never know if any you know if any of those trees had had a genetic resistance to the insect um you know i would encourage you you know to definitely, if you have a lot of high value ash, to consult with a consulting forester and, and get their opinion on, on how to move forward with the management of that stand. Um, sort of a, a double-edged sword with that situation is oftentimes ash grow on old agricultural sites, rich nutrient rich sites that often have an invasive shrub population. So whether those trees die from the insect or you, you harvest them commercially, you oftentimes release that established population of invasive shrubs. So you kind of then more transition that site to a, an alien system. So it's a diff, it is a, a very significant management challenge. We do um, test for emerald ash borer. If you see those triangular shaped purple things hanging from trees, those are emerald ash borer traps. And the uh, Forest Health Division takes those down and counts the numbers of insects that are in there. In addition, we stress trees all over the state by girdling them and then cut them down and actually take all the bark off to see if there are any galleries, if they've been infested with the emerald ash borer. So we're studying those all over the state uh, and trying to be very proactive about where they're noticed. And Alyssa also points out that um, not next week, but the week after, we do have a presenter who is going to be speaking on climate adapted species. So I'm interested for people who are trying to make choices for what to plant on their uh, for future crops, things like that. Um, 